fresh meat. Get away from her, you... You know what the deal is. Sigourney Weaver's Ripley is one of the greatest action heroines of all time. And yeah, 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 technically Aliens is an action movie. But this franchise is firmly planted in horror. And this story is so crazy, we had to cover it. So join us on Planet LV426, and let's find out what the f*** happened to James Cameron's Aliens. You would think that after Alien took the world by storm in 1979 that a sequel would be obvious. But execs at 20th Century Fox were unconvinced. They felt much of the success had come from renewed interest in space due to Star Wars being such a big hit. Kind of dismissive of the ingenuity of Alien, but whatever. With constantly changing regimes, there was never enough momentum behind a sequel to ever receive a green light. In 1983, James Cameron had built up quite the reputation as a screenwriter for Rambo First Blood Part 2. While prepping for his sophomore effort, The Terminator, Cameron was given the unfortunate news that star Arnold Schwarzenegger would be unavailable due to commitments on Conan the Destroyer. Finding himself with more time on his hands, but not enough to complete an entire movie, Cameron accepted the writing gig from Fox to write an Alien sequel, but also pitched directing it as well. Fox felt he just didn't have enough experience, though, having only directed Piranha 2 The Spawning at this point in his career. However, after The Terminator was such a huge success, Fox backtracked and felt Cameron had the chops to direct his script. And yes, the rumors of Cameron's original pitch meeting was confirmed recently by the director himself. He simply wrote out the word alien on a whiteboard, added an S, and made that S into a money sign. Sometimes simplicity really does work. Now that the director was in place, the real work had to begin. I want to thank you guys for watching What the F*** Happened to This Horror Movie? and ask that if you enjoy our shows, please subscribe to our channel right now, like this video, and click on the bell so you can be notified each time a new video goes up. And now, back to the show. You're going out there to destroy them, right? Not to study, not to bring back. With such a large task at hand, Cameron felt he needed a producer he could really trust. So he backed his Terminator producer, Gail Ann Hurd, for the role. There was one slight problem, though. Heard was Cameron's girlfriend, and rather inexperienced, having only produced two films. So the studio was understandably hesitant, worried that Cameron was simply in over his head. Gail had several of her sources in the industry inform the studio that she was legitimate, and Cameron assured them that she would be the only person that would actually stand up to him on set. This ended up being true, and Heard was a vital cog in the machine. But no piece was more important than the queen at the center of it all. No, no, not that one. Sigourney Weaver. At the end of Alien, Weaver's Ripley had been left floating in space with the only other survivor, the cat. With how much her character connected to audiences, bringing her back felt like the only route. But Weaver was always very skeptical when it came to a sequel. She declined many offers to return feeling the studio was simply doing it for financial reasons. Even James Cameron's script only had her mildly interested. But the producers played a bit of hardball, telling Weaver's agent through the grapevine that they were in the process of writing out the Ripley character. Thankfully, this was enough to convince Weaver to return. Though, I'm sure the million dollar payday and percentage of the box office didn't hurt either. The story that 20th Century Fox finally agreed upon was decidedly more action-oriented than its predecessor. It follows Ripley as she is asked to join a mission back to LV-426 with a group of space marines. Rather than just the sole alien on the spaceship like in the original, the plot was in its namesake with a bevy of aliens taking over the planet. We saw just how much havoc one of these things can cause so an entire hive of them was downright terrifying. 
One of the core elements of the film is the motherly relationship between Ripley and Newt, played by Carrie Henn. The actress was an unknown and cast due to her solemn demeanor. The bond between her and Weaver is poignant, and you often find yourself rooting for them in every situation. Ripley! When Newt and Ripley are separated, you feel it in your bones, and you want nothing more than Ripley to get her back. That's fantastic storytelling. The Space Marines were all put through a two-week boot camp where they were able to bond and get into shape. They were also given extensive weapons and combat training in order to look like actual Marines. The group of scoundrels is full of recognizable faces, though most were relatively unknown at the time. Jeanette Goldstein, Bill Paxton, Mark Rolston, and William Holt filled out some of the other Marines. Originally, James Remar was cast in the role of Corporal Hicks. While it was a mystery as to why Remar was replaced, he revealed in an interview with Empire that it was due to being arrested for drugs. So we can put the rumors of creative differences to rest. Michael Bain, having worked with Cameron on Terminator, was brought in. In what had almost become part of the film's behind-the-scenes lore, Michael was considered an outsider by the other Marines. And while that was true, Bane grew close with his co-star Bill Paxton. Given how much more screen time they share together than the rest, it kinda makes sense. Rounding out the cast was Lance Henriksen as Bishop and Paul Reiser as Burke. Henriksen played the role of the ship android, and you immediately distrust him due to the actions of the android and alien. It makes for an interesting performance, as he clearly enjoys toying with the audience's expectations. He originally had contact lenses that would split his pupils, but Cameron was against them, thinking they made Bishop more terrifying than the aliens. I say we grease this rat fuck son of a bitch right now. Burke is just the ultimate corporate asshole, and Riser inhabits the role perfectly. He's the one guy that you're rooting for the aliens to get. And when the moment finally happens, it is just so satisfying. Stan Winston was brought on to do the creature effects after he'd impressed with his work on The Terminator. He innovates in both the design of the drone aliens, as well as the massive queen herself. Hydraulically powered, the queen is an absolute feat of engineering. But the real genius comes with how it was shot. Staying on it too long resulted in a lot of the magic being lost, so Cameron was very deliberate with his framing and length of shot. Cameron was extremely difficult to work with on set due to his intense demand. Just watch as he talks to the props guy about a very small effect of the facehugger jumping towards camera. Okay, stick it up there. Let's see what you got. All right, now pull it so it lands right on the lens when I say action. It wasn't terribly convincing. I want you to pull it so that it looks like it's leaping. It doesn't look like it's leaping. Don't you have gloves? Get some gloves. You can't pull hard without gloves. Get, get some gloves and call me when you're ready for this. All of that for a very minor shot, but he was very particular about how things should be and the crew were just treating it as another job. Because to them, it was. These frustrations came to a head when it came to tea time. See, in the British film industry, tea time is not something you messed with. They were to have a break at 10 a.m. and 2 p.m., where they could drink tea and eat biscuits. But Cameron was having none of it. He just saw it as a waste of essential production time. Eventually, the crew nearly mutinied, leaving the set in the midst of a shooting day. Cameron was rightfully pissed, feeling they were trying to sabotage his production. And the crew was just as pissed, feeling they were being treated like cattle. Heard played mediator, trying to calm James down as she knew they didn't have many options. England was a hotbed for the film industry at the time, and crews were in high demand. The chances of them being able to get one and still complete the film was slim to none. So they called a onset meeting, where Cameron addressed the crew. They agreed to be more supportive of his vision and he agreed to be more accommodating for their tea time. Still, there was no love lost between the two sides. When filming finally completed, Cameron brought them together and gave them quite the speech. This has been a long and difficult shoot, fraught by many problems. But the one thing that kept me going through it all was the certain knowledge that one day I would drive out of the gate of Pinewood and never come back. 
and that you sorry bastards would still be here. Yikes. That's one hell of a goodbye. The beautiful sets were built at an abandoned power plant. While there were concerns about the rusted metal throughout, the biggest issue came from asbestos. Given the dangers, they had to implement a heavy-duty air filtration system, which upped the budget. By the time they were done though, the air was cleaner on set than off of it. I'd say pretty well done. Despite all of the on-set turmoil, the results were in the dailies. Cameron was delivering a kinetic action film with high production values. Word spread through the film industry, and suddenly, the Alien sequel that no one thought would work was the talk of the town. By the time promotional materials were released, it looked like Fox had a real hit on their hands. James Horner provided a memorable score on a very tight schedule. It's crazy that the music turned out so good, given that Horner only had three weeks to complete it. While he had expected to have six total weeks, when he arrived in London, there was no film for him to score. Cameron wasn't finished yet. Unused parts of Horner's score were later used in Die Hard. Just makes Horner's work all the more impressive. Have you ever been mistaken for a man? No. Have you? Aliens released on July 18th, 1986 and managed to bring in $183 million at the box office. Or maybe 131? See, box office numbers for 1986 are very inconsistent outside of the United States and Canada. Because of this, the non-North American box office totals are extremely unreliable. Though Fox's own estimate has the film at 157 million worldwide, so we'll go with that one. You don't see them bucking each other over for a goddamn percentage. Aliens was widely acclaimed, with both fans and critics praising the film. Sigourney Weaver even received an Academy Award nomination. Practically unheard of for sci-fi and horror at the time. The film has been absurdly loved over the years. While the entire Alien property has seen plenty of merchandise, the love for Aliens seems to surpass them all. With several video games, comics, and toys, the love for the world that James Cameron expanded upon is evident across all sorts of media. Most action horror has Aliens to thank for establishing the blueprint. Heck, look at Neil Marshall's Dog Soldiers. It's pretty much Aliens with werewolves. Unfortunately, the series has never really lived up to the high standards set forth by both Alien and Aliens. Alien 3 essentially takes the triumphant ending of Aliens and turns it on its head, killing off most of the characters. And Resurrection almost feels like a fever dream. The Alien vs Predator series is just brainless action. And do not even get me started on Ridley Scott's attempts at returning to the franchise. Ugh. Thankfully, Noah Hawley is currently in the midst of developing an Alien TV show. Given his track record, this is the best shot we have at Alien returning to its former prestige. Whether that actually happens or not is anyone's guess, but thankfully we received a journey like no other back in 1986. It provided us an action hero for both boys and girls alike. And most importantly, it respected the original by providing us something completely different. In the current landscape of cloned cinema, this feat feels even more impressive. So the next time you're looking for some good old fashioned horrific action, pop in aliens. Don't get overzealous though. Hey, maybe you haven't been keeping up on current events, but we just got our asses kicked, pal! 